by AWS Meetup. So thanks for uh, getting up. And a uh, couple of announcements. Uh, yeah. Washrooms around the corner. And in case of fire or emergency, please follow the crowd. Right? So just go to the green man. That's good. And then uh, one more important announcement. Uh, AC3, the organization I work for, we are hiring. We are looking for DevOps engineers at all levels, associate, uh, junior, uh, senior, at all levels. So if you are looking for a job or if you know someone who's looking for a job, please send them in our way, uh, AC3, or you can talk to me after the meetup. And then Sean doesn't need any introduction. And then I'm sure they're also hiring. But then, yeah, come to me, not to you. <laughs> yeah, but then uh, yeah. he doesn't need any uh, introduction. I'll leave it with him. Okay. Hi everyone. Um, welcome along. Thanks for um, thanks for coming out. Um, I'm Shane Davis. I'm from um, Consigna. Um, I'm the my role at Consigna is cloud evangelist. So um, I'm out in the community um, and at clients, helping them understand what the art of the possible is. Um, and I'm also the um, product manager um, for Inteso Cloud which I'll uh, explain that, what that is in a, in a tip. So this is the agenda. Um, we'll, we'll meet, we'll find out what Inteso is all about, because that's what a lot of this um, pipeline and thing got, got built around. Um, we'll have a look at the challenges and problems that, that we had. So we've kind of built this awesome product, and then we're like, how do we deploy that really quickly? Um, have a look at what the requirements and objectives of that deployment model needed to be. Have a look at the solution that we came up with. Um, break that down into pieces so you can sort of wrap your head around it a bit. Um, and then as time permits, I'll just dive deeper and deeper down until, uh, yeah, <laughs> everybody's had enough. And then we'll run through um, questions. So um, the challenge was, is um, 12 months ago, um, we were approached by um, AWS to, um, they wanted to figure out, like they were working with a company called Unique who builds these um, digital humans. And they were like, what would happen if we put our cognitive CX in behind, um, in behind a digital human? So the Cognitive CX is all their Lex and Poly and you know machine learning capability, data dipping, all that, like basically giving a digital human a brain, right? Um, we had a very short time span to make this work, so um, we just smashed out all the pieces in two sprints, four weeks, roughly. Um, so as you could imagine, if a bunch of you know devs and tech people just go hacking away on a keyboard, you, you know you're not going to have a very pretty repeatable solution because there's a lot of trial and error trying to get it working. You know, you, you guys know the drill. So, you know, this is pretty typical of, of a lot of, you know, I've, I've been a dev for I'm nearly 30 years in the industry now. I started as a developer and I've done all sorts of things through IT, right? And um, a typical kind of problem when you're a product team or you're a development team is you come up with this cool idea, the CEO sees it and he goes, man, that's awesome, let's sell it. And you're like, hang on, hang on, <laughs> it's just a prototype. You know, we're not ready. So what, and, and so what ends up happening is you kind of very often have this, um, you know, prototype sort of um, product that you've just proven that it can work, right? Um, and all of a sudden, people are excited about it. They, you know, they're out there trying to sell it. And you know, your first kind of step, uh, typically in that, is you're manually provisioning it. And when somebody comes along and says, you know, people love it. We need ten of them. You're like, dude, that's like that's a huge challenge, right? So to start off with, there's the, this evolution that I see of um, going through DevOps or orchestration, you know, that sort of thing. What I've typically seen everywhere is it starts life as a, as a manual process. Um, 
you know, you, you go, let's write some scripts to, because we, we're sick of going into the console and doing this every other day. So you get a kind of set of shell scripts or Python scripts, but they're kind of all over, they're very piecemeal, they're all over the show, and you've got to remember what, you know, you might have a document that's this big that goes, you know, run this, do this, put these settings here, and, you know, I've got a picture of a Rube Goldberg machine in the background there, because that's often how these early scripts and early pipelines sort of start off, you know, they're kind of half automated, it breaks, you jump in the console and run some commands and away it goes, right? Um, quite often the, the, you know, configuration for this stuff is all over the show. You know, you might have a file here, you might have some system parameters, you've got to remember to manually set them up before you trigger your, you know, your, um, your pipeline. And, and you just got all these points of failure. So you're kind of slightly um, improving stuff as you move from manual to shell scripts. You start templating some stuff. So I usually find that that deployment template bit, you've got a relatively smooth, you're probably down to about, you know, something that probably took you a week to do manually to deploy it, like a big, like a complex app, right? Um, with templates and scripts and that sort of thing, um, you're probably down to about a day, a half a day to configure and deploy it. So it's way better than you were before. But you haven't really, you know, got a single click. You go, set ten, spend minute, ten minutes on a config, hit a button, and boom, it's deployed, right? So, uh, and this kind of deployment evolution through to full orchestration. I mean, I've done it a number of times on big projects with really, you know, chunky services underneath them. And they take time, you know, like you're talking like eight months to develop all of the stuff and get, because from going from manual to having it just auto magically go, you know, if you've ever worked with Zookeeper and some of those old school Apache um, type of clustering type of thing. Anybody that's done any of that knows how painful it is to try and, you know, automate it. So you just press one button every single time and it, and it just works, right? So looking at what we wanted to accomplish, like I was pretty opinionated on this, um, you know, have it, because I've just, you know, I should be greyer than I am and have less hair than I do, but um, there you go. So for me as a developer, like I don't want to have to care what I'm deploying to. I just want to write my code, write my application, commit it to a repo, and, and it gets deployed and it works, right? It goes through the pipeline, does the tests, and bada boom, it's there, right? So, so for me, personally as a dev, I just want to deploy code. You know, I want to focus on my application. Um, I'm really strong on separating infrastructure from application. Okay, so what I mean by that is, you know, I've seen lots of orchestration suites and pipelines and that sort of thing where if you're making application change, it's got to go through the whole entire pipeline, figure out whether it needs to rebuild the infrastructure, which usually it doesn't, and it's just slow and painful. I mean, again, as an app developer, especially if I've just got a front-end app that I'm, I'm working on, I shouldn't need to rebuild my whole stack or have the pipeline assess whether I need to do that just to change, you know, make a feature change um, when I push it up. And the other reason for separating infrastructure from application, and particularly with serverless type stuff, is, you know, infrastructure changes. Once you've got that base architecture done, it changes very infrequently. You know, unless you're making some major change in your application um, that requires some other service, right, um, that, that um, infrastructure should be hardly changing at all. Whereas your application, that should be changing at a minimum daily. As you're getting your customer feedback, you're putting in new features in the pipeline, like that's, that's the dream of CICD. You can get a feature request, you develop it, and a single sprint, you pump it out. Um, so you want that to be really rapid and rep repetitive. The other thing I wanted was like real simple configuration within the repo. 
you know, again, working with pipelines and things, I don't want to have to run a bunch of scripts that set up system parameters here, there, or everywhere, you know? Um, and, and, and it's kind of keeping the, to some degree, it's keeping that code and its configuration um, together. And as I kind of walk through the solution we came up with, you'll see why that's really handy and, and, and powerful, right? Um, avoid cloud formation. Hands up here who loves writing raw cloud formation. <laughs> Jimmy, Jimmy. <laughs> there's always one. But, um, but like once it's written. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But man, that it can be tedious and painful. If you're trying to build a reasonably big stack, it, it gets grim, right? And the other rule we wanted was was no humans in the cloud. Um, so we didn't want people on consoles. We, you know, like it comes. That points to that first point. As a dev, you commit to a repo. It builds. It triggers the pipeline. Away you go, and keep it simple. You know, we wanted it to be as simple as we could possibly get it. <clears throat> so after some sort of digging around and, and playing with stuff, um, these are kind of the major building blocks um, that we came up with. So our landing zone and account structure, I'll talk to each of these things, but that's an absolute no-brainer. Um, and uh, for everybody here that's still using single AWS accounts, I hope when you go home tonight, you'll start thinking hard about AWS Org's control tower landing zone because I'll demonstrate to you why it's an absolute no-brainer to do, right? Um, CDK pipelines, that's kind of the... So I, I won't... I'll skip over that because I've got a slide that'll talk to it. And AWS Chalice. So Chalice is a, um, is a Python-based framework for... Um, writing um, um, API driven REST applications really quickly and easily. So, why, why the landing zone? Why control tower? This is AWS best practice. That's why um, AWS has invested so much time and energy into coming, uh, up, coming up with a solution for it in control tower. Um, the kind of more customised version of it is, is the landing zone. But essentially, you know, back in the day, 2012, when, when I started um, working with AWS, you had like classic EC2s, the VPCs were only just coming online. But sort of that sort of 2014, that sort of timeline, what, what most people tended to do was have um, one big account and they would separate their stuff with VPCs. You know, but gradually over time we started splitting that out into separate accounts so your production was separate to non-prod um, because you're trying to reduce the blast radius. Um, you're tr and, and like now with AWS orgs, like an account, an AWS account is just an organisational unit. It's just a way of containing all your resources in one place. Um, so this structure that we've got here, with orgs you can um, you can create um, OU. So over there I've got a core OU, um, organisational unit. Um, so you can group your account. What we're doing here is grouping our, our accounts together and, and logical constructs. So we've got like a taller account, shared services account, security, log archive. And you know, talking on my point why it's a no-brainer to have separate accounts. You want to keep all your logs and your security stuff so only your security team can get into that um, security account. You want like stuff feeding into that log account and nobody can go in there, and no person can go in and, and, and write to it. And then over on the left hand side here, I've only got two OUs there, like a non-production environment accounts and, and prod accounts. But you know the, the thing of the um, of AWS organizations is it's flexible enough to to come up with a scheme that suits your business. You know, the what you might split it down by products or business divisions at the uni, at the University of Auckland, they broke down by faculties and then had sub-accounts under that. So 
just gives you heaps of um, um, ability to organize your accounts and separate. Uh, now, one other key point that's useful if you're not doing serverless and you're running EC2 and load balancers and that, by having separate accounts, your non-prod and your prod can have the same, like, network, you know, VPCs, IP ranges and all that kind of stuff. So, um, depending on how you're building things, you're not having to do all that kind of mapping because it's in a separate account or trying to keep all your network separate because that's you're using VPCs to separate your workloads. So there's just tons and tons. If you're not familiar with AWS Org's control tower landing zone, please go and have a look at the AWS site. That's really simple and easy to set up. So CDK pipelines, um, that, so CDK is the AWS cloud development kit. I know lots and lots of people are huge fans of um, Terraform. Um, the reason that I kind of gravitate towards CD like my default is if you're using AWS, try and use native AWS everywhere you can. Just simply because, you know, the kind of fancy features that um, AWS develop on an ongoing basis, right, the stuff just works together by itself, like you don't have to run through loops. Now, the real advantage of um, the CDK is that you can write your infrastructure in the code that you're familiar with. So rather than having to learn cloud formation or learn Terraform or whatever else you want to choose, right, you can write your infrastructure in Python, you know, whatever your language of, like your language um, choices, you can write it in that. And what it outputs, and I'll show you later on in the, through the presentation, is it spits out, so you write it in Python, you tell the CDK to synthesize it, so it takes your code and figures out what it needs to do to turn that into a CloudFormation template, right? Um, and you get simple, consistent CloudFormation every time. The cool thing is, is if you want to go in and customise what it's done for whatever reason, either because it, it's not quite doing something you want it to out of the box or, you know, whatever reason, you can do that. You can have it synthesise your CloudFormation um, template. Well, even before you do that, you can go, hey, I want to override this property. And then when it synthesises the CloudFormation um, template, it will do that for you. CDK pipelines... I think it's still in preview, it's not actually full production yet, um, but, but the concept behind it is that you can create this kind of single self-mutating environment pipeline, which I'll show you what that is because it's a lot of words, but basically where I said I want to deploy um, from a repo, what it can do is watch my repo and when I do a code commit because I change, you know, code or, or um, an application or whatever, it'll trigger it to redeploy and it will assess what it needs to update um, and, and mutate the pipeline, <coughs> which I'll explain in a bit more detail later on so you can understand what I'm talking about, and, and deploy out. Um, AWS Chalice, reason I'm doing that, using this is because... Um, I, I like Python. I'm very multilingual. I started out in the days of um, Basic and Pascal and everything. I've probably done nearly every language you can, you know, think of in between C, C++, you name it. Um, but I kind of like Python at the moment. It does the job for me. Um, so Chalice, Chalice is it's basically a, a framework that. Like as you can see from my code sample there, um, like it's using the um, those meta tag things, and I'm going. Here's the route. It's form data. I want to use this as a get method for it. Um, I want to use an authorizer, a custom function that I'm using to authorize that API call, and then look how small my code is. You know, like that's returning, uh, like I'm going, give me a record for this, this API here, it's like for create storing forms, like form data, right? And this is just saying, hey, give me, give me the, the form fields for this user ID, 
and return it to me. So a couple of lines of code, and boom, done. And um, there's this, in fact, there's a sample usage there. So I'm just like I, I've like somewhere else I grabbed the token, um, and then I'm just doing my API call with the authorization token. So kind of summing up what I've gone through, and, I, and then I'll get into a bit more detail. So the key features of what we've been able to put together were these kind of three key components as a single self-mutating environment pipeline. And when I say environment, if, if, you, if I go back to um, this, each of the, like tenant A, that's an environment, like that's the non-prod environment for that tenant, right? Um, tenant B, non-prod environment. So each of those little accounts there are what I'm referring to as environments. So what I'm saying is I can define a whole application and then say I want to, and here's the definition for this account, deploy it to that. Here's the definition for that account, deploy it to that. And when I add those environments, the pipeline triggers and does it. So at scale, you can pump out, like, because we're, we're producing and Tesla as a SaaS platform, we want to be able to deploy environments very, very rapidly. Um, so, um, what else? Auto build on code commit, I've talked about a little, a little bit. Self contained microservices. So, when I dive into how we've kind of put this together, what, like the whole, that digital human um, solution that we've got there, um, we can throw modules into it, like the forms capability. Um, we can have it dial out to Amazon Connect. We can hook into ServiceNow. So all of those we're treating as microservices. And if a client needs that capability, we just add that as a, as a microservice and the, the top level application can consume it. But it also means that we, you know, the whole key concept of microservices is one team can own like ServiceNow integration. They can focus on that. They've got their own um, timeline and roadmap to develop that feature and the same for other, all the other features they, they get um, developed independently and that's the power of microservices over having a monolithic application that you have to deploy the whole application every time right um, we've got the ability and I'll show you how to be able to test feature branches easily so um, some of the stuff I'll show you in the configuration, and this is where I was talking about having the con configuration live with the repo. If I'm developing a feature, I want to test that in the non-prod develop, um, development um, environment. I could either spin up a whole new environment to do it, but like for tests, we're running pretty expensive um, services like Elasticsearch and, and all sorts of machine learning in behind. So it's a bit expensive to do that. So in our non-prod, we just have one copy. So it might sit on the develop branch, and I want to test a new feature. I can switch over to a feature branch. It'll trigger a deployment. I can test my feature. When I'm happy with it, I can merge it back in and put the, put the stack back onto that develop branch, right? Um, and modular pipelines. Um, and this is kind of goes hand in hand with the microservices a bit. So as I kind of dive down into the types of things I can do with this pipeline, um, every piece, like each piece that I'm creating is, is a single modular piece that I can add in to the code very fast and easy. Um, and less humans in the cloud, you know. These things are always in evolution. Like nobody, you know, it's never a good idea to just build something and go, there, we're done, that's it. Because, you know, in six months' time, it's going to be obsolete. It's not, you know, the world moves on, right? So, um, so you, you know, you, and you want to do everything in an iterative process. So even if you've got a really great pipeline, or you've got a great, you know, approach to how you're doing things, um, um, you're always improving it. You can, you know, there's always improvements you can go. Because you don't want to build, you know, this monster, like spend two years building a monster thing that never sees the light of day. 
you just want to release an early version of it and then that gives you the ability to iterate over time. So I'll kind of dive, so this is coming back to this environment um, pipeline concept. So, and this is where this will start tying together all those individual pieces that I was talking about. So, what we've got is this central tooling account, right? And what the tooling account is going to do is I'm going to tell it, I'm up on the um, right there, I'm giving it a, an environment ID that it can find under that sites. So, each environment has its own config. Um, I'm telling it the account number that I want to deploy to, um, what region you know that account is. So, you know, I could have a bunch of these, the same account, but different regions, for example, right? Um, and then for each of those, that that um, configuration there, it's it can be whatever it wants, right? So in here, I'm telling it this is where my application. Like, here's the API name. So just to explain this, what I'm deploying here is a back-end API and a front-end um, single-page application that's consuming that API, right? So that's what these configs are about, like, this is the name that, that I want for the API, um, here's the, the um, repo for the, for the single-page app, there's a branch that I want, so this is so if I wanted to jump to the develop branch or you know, I wanted to switch to that feature branch, I change that branch there, I recommit to the repo, and boom, it'll switch over to it'll switch the stack to that and pull the code from, from that branch. Um, and then there's just a bunch of other stuff that, that helps glue all this together because what my um, you know CDK definition do, is doing is it's um, building everything that I need. It's building CloudFront, it's build, doing, putting all the Route 53 records in there that I need. There's, like I said, no manual configuration and no humans in the cloud. I don't want to have to go into the AWS console or run CLI to, you know, to connect stuff up. I just want my pipeline to do it. So if I have a look, so this is this is kind of gluing it all together even more, right? So this is what my pipeline in this particular instance is going to build. So there's my CDK app at the beginning here, and what I do is I deploy that to the tooling account, right? I only have to do that once. I deploy it to the tooling account. And what it builds, what it creates, is that environment's pipeline. And where it's getting its source code from that pipeline is that CDK repo. So back in that, um, I might not have it in this um, particular shot, but there's a, there's a higher level config file here that basically tells the pipeline where it finds its, um, its source code, its repo. So once I've deployed that once, that um, CDK app into that tooling account, it only ever looks at that repo for changes. So as soon as it sees a change on that repo, it triggers the pipeline and it will, you know, if I've told it, hey, I want another environment, it will go and build that other environment. Um, so the first thing that it does is it um, builds an application pipeline. Because as I said, I, I want my application pipeline to be separate, right? Um, and also, yeah, and then so if we go to the next level down, that's up in the tooling account, right? And so this pipeline is building my API stack. Okay, I could separate that into another pipeline and, and a separate repo, but the way I've, we've got stuff running at the moment, we're kind of happy enough for it to be in there because it's quite, it's quite small, not onerous. And so what this API stack's building is basically an API gateway with backed by Lambda functions. Right? Um, so that's servicing the API route through CloudFront here. Now my app pipeline, it's got its own separate repo there, so the developers can develop to their heart's content every time they commit. 
that triggers that app pipeline. And what it's building is its cloud formation stacks, right? Um, so it's building CloudFront, um, it's updating the Route 53 records, um, and, and our single page app files are in here. So it's ingesting like we're using ReactJS. So this pipeline, this app pipeline here, it's pulling in a ReactJS source code, it's doing the build, it's doing the, the test on it, um, and, then it's, and then it's spitting it out into the bucket here and doing all the connections. Um, the other thing that I haven't got diagrammed here, and because um, you know this would get way too complicated if I put every single piece in, but the other thing that this API stack does here is if I need DynamoDB tables to, to drive my Lambda functions, it's like in this case it's formed out of that's sucking in and out, that, that stack can build all of that as well. So, is everybody kind of following this so far? And as I was putting this together, I thought, man, I'm going to be covering a lot of ground here. But I was kind of hoping that as I got to these higher level um, sort of diagrams that would start coming together for people. And then when I start kind of diving down into the mechanics of how it works, and I can flip back to these higher level ones, hopefully it kind of, you know, starts to gel with everybody. Um, and they can kind of understand, you know, how it all comes together and works. Uh, so, what I'll do is... Um, Oh, I've got one question. I guess. Yeah. So you're talking about putting the site, um, the configuration, and the repo. Yeah. Which I've I've gone down that route until I go. Oh, I've got secrets. Yeah. I okay. Yeah. Those. Good point. So, um, so up in my um, up in my pipeline up here. So there's a handful of places that I can um, access secrets. So I can either do it like. I can either do it um, down here at the Lambda function, like if I've got secrets and we're doing that, like some of the Lambdas need to get a hold of secrets yeah. to do. So, and again, I can just, uh, all I need to do in that config is, um, is just say, hey, here's the secret for this thing. Or I could, you know, the other thing I'm a huge fan of is using like naming conventions and tags. So applications can figure out themselves where a resource is and go and find it themselves if they need to. Do um, um, how do you manage the different configurations of particular environments? For instance, that versus task versus So I, if I go back to um, so these are like these are like I don't know like maybe these are like arrays. So each environment, like I'd just have a comma and then I'd have another environment, right? So, and then this, this config down here is the specific um, configuration for, um, for that particular environment. Yeah, so I could, you know, have my, my prod, the separate account numbers, so I can have my prod, my non-prod, or, you know, all the rest of it. And the, the other sort of strategy that we've been using, um, I mean, it works at the moment. I'm happy with it at the moment, but we might change direction down the, the thing, down the path. But for each client that we have, like each SaaS client that we have, we create a branch off the, off the main repo, and that branch belongs to them. But the reason I'm saying, like, we're not fully committed to that at this point because... Um, as we're getting the code to be smarter and smarter, it's having less diff like less customization and differences between SaaS clients. So we might figure out a better way, like the, the config is generally the only thing that's changing a lot of times. So what the direction we'll probably start heading in is where we go, hey, your configuration for this is living over here. Um, and actually, you know, and store it somewhere else. So, I have a question. So, how do you give the graphs account access 
to the Python because we have Python in, in different accounts. Yeah, so so the way that that works is um, so with the cloud development kit, I'll go back to the oh yeah. So with this cloud development kit, um, each of the accounts that you're going to use, um, you like do a CDK bootstrap in it, and when you bootstrap it, you tell this account that it trusts this account. Okay. Yeah. And then that's the kind of where we want to get to, like Jimmy Morgan from RWS that's at the back there. We're, we're keen to work, like he's like the control tower landing zone guru. So we can, and one of the one of the advantages of um, the the orgs is it has an account vending machine. So each time I have a service catalog and I can go, hey, I need an Atesso SaaS client account. And there'll be a definition in the service catalog for that type of account and it'll provision it with all the guardrails and other bits and pieces that it needs. Um, but where we want to get to is, is it will CDK boot it and trust our tooling account. Um, it'll kick off some um, pipelines and just automatically deploy the whole application. So again, our objective is to get to single button clicks, right? And then all, of, all changes after that happen through, happen through code commits. So, um, so I mean, at a kind of high level, does everybody kind of get where we go? Because <laughs> what I'll do is I can jump, I, I'll um, jump into my, what I was going to do was, so I'll show you just a couple of things to give you concept of it. So the other cool thing about, um, this is our um, Intesso account. So the other thing, and you can see we've got separate like demo in here. There's a, you know, there's some test client accounts in here. We've got a dev account. But if I want to get to the console for any of these, I can just drop this and go into the management console. And the other one that I use quite a lot is if I need CLI um, access, I can go here and copy that and then I've got a little script in my terminal that'll update my credentials and I can um, jump into the account. So one, one benefit of this is that you can see an easily consumable list of all the accounts that you've got access to um, and it's really easy to, you know, to get your credentials um, to um, you know, jump in the console if, if you need to do that but we try and deter people from doing that. <laughs> we want to automate everything beforehand. Um, this is our um, digital human product. So this is what our pipelines are building. So this is a, this is a single page app that I was talking about. Um, she'll be a little bit slow because this is just a dev copy and we don't keep it warm all the time, but it, it will run. So I'll do a quick demo of of this. Make the sounds through. Hi, Tess. How can I assist you today? I've got a new person starting. I need a new laptop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can help you with access and onboarding. To get started, could you please tell me your name? So that's that's the product that we're building, and. Um, the reason that we needed an automated pipeline to build this is because what like at the front is just this like React you know app, but in behind that is Lexbox and Lambdas and you know Kendra and Elasticsearch to the wazoo, right? And um, and and yeah, you 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 just can't deploy, you can't scale at speed without having a, a set of pipelines to do that. Um, what I do is, so one of the cool things that I, hang on, I'll pull these up here. So one of the features that I really like about the um, CDK, and this is where I can write my code in Python and it will synthesize a stack for me, 
So one of the things that I like about it is if I tell it CDK synth, right, it's going to go away and build my CloudFormation stack for me. Now, and there's my CloudFormation stack, right? Now straight away, I know I can deploy this CloudFormation stack. If I'd made errors in my code, I'd get a bunch of errors here and go, I actually don't commit that. So before I do a commit, I can do a synth here. Um, and, you know, obviously we could automate this in the pipeline so it actually tries to do a synth first. But, um, you know, a bit like unit testing. I could, personally, I like to kind of test as much as I can locally on my dev machine um, before I do, you know, rather than deploying it and going through a whole lot of unit tests that are just going to fail or whatever. I'd rather um, I'd rather get it um, get it tested first locally. So I just um, touch on some of the things that I was talking about. So this what we're seeing here. This is my um, so this is the forms API thing that I was talking about, and it's got a front end and a back end to it. Um, and th so here's my pipeline repo here. So when I was talking, there's a separate repo from the, um, from the application repo. This is what I was talking about. And again, I can change the branch here. So if I want to test different branches or whatever, it's pretty simple and easy to do. And we're using um, uh, AWS CodeStar um, connections to hook into, we're using GitHub. Um, you can also use like code commit. That's like whatever you're using, or Bitbucket, or you know whatever you're using for version control. So this is my um, configuration for this, um, and what else? And this is just like um, this is um, the, just telling it what my what my pipeline account is, um, and what region I want to deploy to, right? And then the client's definition, you saw that screenshot before. So that's telling it where's the target client account, where's that front end going to get deployed to, um, and then just a bunch of stuff so it can create the hosted zones and, and that sort of thing. So, um, so this is kind of kicks it, like this is where, you can hard code these, but I hate hard, hard coding stuff. Like, if I can get a configuration for something, that's my first preference. It makes stuff much more um, dynamic. So basically, um, here's, here's actually all my code here. So here's my pipe. So if I go to this pipeline stack, this is kind of um, where, this is where stuff starts coming together, right? So basically, what I'm doing, this is my high level environment pipeline. So we're defining where our repo is. Um, we're telling it, like we're giving it a, a how to synthesize that, that beginning stack. Um, and, then we, um, and then we start building this, you know, we're building this environment pipeline. And this is where I'm pumping out to however many, like if I need to deploy this application to 20 accounts, I just have like 20 definitions in there, and this thing will just loop through and deploy them out, right? If I was having to do 20 accounts, I'd probably um, simplify that a little bit so I can cut the configuration down because probably a lot of it's going to be pretty repetitive. But nonetheless, um, you know, that ability to, to pump stuff out like non prod, prod, test, whatever it is I, I need to do. Um, you know, it's done really, really quickly, right? Um, and then here's my components. So I've got this, there's the static site. Um, whoops. Here's my, like, um, site deploy. So what I'm doing is building the, like, S3 bucket, the cloud front, the components that I need for my application. And once they're provisioned, then I'm saying, okay, go build the React app and deploy it into that S3 bucket and, and validate the um, CloudFront distro so, so I get the latest version of it, right? And, um, yeah, so that's that top-level pipeline. Um, and what I might do, if you bear with me a second, 
as I'll jump into the console so you can kind of see what this is what this is building out. Um, so if I go on my tooling account here, close your eyes if you see anything sensitive. <laughs> So I go to I'll go to my pipelines, right, and I'll just narrow this down. So just to keep things simple, like see this test demo. So I'm um, like I said, I'm big on naming conventions. Like I want to be able to look at lists of things and be able to tell straight away what that is. So here's my app pipeline. So I know that this is deploying. This is for the forms that you are. And um, this is deploying that um, single page app. Um, and here's my environment um, pipeline. So if I do 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 pipelines, I'll jump into this. So here's that, you know, in that config, here's the, um, that's pulling the source code in for, the, for that top level pipeline. Um, it's, this is where it's synthesizing it, so this, this is where it mutates itself, and as I get down I'll explain what I mean by mutating. Um, this, yeah, this is a self-mutate here, so if I add an environment, right, and I scroll further down here, it'll add another one of these. So this is test demo AU, maybe I might add test demo US, I want to run it out of the states, right? Um, so this thing would, um, I'd add that configuration, you'd see this kicking off, you'd see this self-mutating, and then when it's finished, you'd see another one of these pop up in the pipeline, right? That's what we mean about self-mutating pipelines. Uh, we update the pipeline, we grab a bunch of assets, I'll, I'll touch on that later, what they are. That's basically the um, components that it needs to build that single page app. Um, here's my single page app that it's deploying, um, and my, my, my pipeline um, that's deploying that. Like, there's the preparation, there's the deployment of it. Where am I up to? I'll go back to here. So th that's what this pipeline stack is building, right? And then these, here's my, um, so this web service stage, this is, like, that's where Chalice comes in. So I'm using Chalice to build me an API gateway that's um, powered by um, Lambda functions. Um, and if we have a quick look at that, we jump into application. This, like, that's kind of... Does that bit work? Sorry? Does that bit work? Do you, does CDK support Chalice or it does, are you calling yeah. it directly? No, so, no, it doesn't. It supports it. Um, so what I'm doing is, if I go to... Um, just give me a minute. So if I jump into this Chalice app, here's the, here's the um, C, Chalice CDK. Okay. Yeah, so it's actually um, so it's actually building the the chalice app for me. Well, it's doing more than that, and this is why why I like it and why it's cool. So when I first started with chalice, I was like, man, this is awesome. But I've got to manually create DB tables if I need them, and I need to do this and do the other thing, right? And if you have a look at the um, the chalice like Slack channels and those other kind of things. There's lots of people going, how do I do this? How do I do that? And the answer is you couple it up with CDK, right? So for example, application um, repo is... Um, and, you know, the cool thing about this is I can build as many of those different pipelines to my heart's desire. So if I've got a pretty complex, you know, application and, and, I, you know, and we're looking at that microservices model, right? I can just in CDK and make a new like pipeline for it, and those devs can lock themselves out on that pipeline, and it all just kind of glues together. I guess the other point around the um, the other feature that you can do this, like if I've built a stack over here, I can export values out of it, and then import those values in over here. 
So that's how I'm managing where I've, we've got kind of the bot brain that's over here and when we add a forms component into it, it just says, it just like looks for that, it imports that exported value of where the forms microservice is. So it's really fast and easy to kind of integrate um, all these stacks together. Um, yeah. So, um, without, you know, I could, yeah, I think if I go too much further into the code and that sort of thing, I'm probably going to lose people. Um, but, but, you know, the key kind of um, point I wanted to get across was that salt, like how do you scale this stuff out at speed, you know? Like for us to build a new microservice now, like an SPA app with an API back end, it's, um, you know, depending on the complexity of it, it's taking us like a couple of three days end to end. And, and we can deploy it at scale. Like not only can we develop it really quickly because we can reuse, you know, every one of these site pipelines, the static site. So if I look at this one, it's where it's building the S3 bucket with CloudFront in front of it, right? Um, so there's my bucket. Um, and this is what I mean by abstracting away the cloud formation. I can still give it most of the definitions that you would see in CloudFormation. And anybody that's familiar with Terraform, like some of the stuff will be looking familiar to you, right? So I can just give it the definition. But it figures out, you know, um, how it's going to turn it into CloudFormation. And um, when I did that synth um, earlier on before, I can even look at the CloudFormation template that it's produced. So one of the good tricks about this when you start playing around with this stuff and doing it is there's some little kind of gotchas sometimes when you're adding resources and they have dependencies. So you can actually look through the cloud formation um, script. Like, look how big the IAM role is just to run that app. Like, imagine writing this by hand, right? Like, <laughs> I hated writing cloud formation. I'm really lazy. So look how big this, you know, this template is. It's massive, right? Um, you know, and, and it took a couple of seconds to produce that. So at any rate, I can look at my template and actually see what it spit it out. So ways that I've used that is at this higher level here. Um, like here's all my assemblies of my separate pieces. So there's the forms API. So this has got like all the template and pieces that it needs for that. Um, this is my app pipeline. You know, here's all the separate components. And then down here is the JSON template that, that puts all of that together. So when I was talking about um, customizing um, pieces of the cloud formation before it actually synthesizes, I can um, have a look inside this template to go, oh, whereabouts is that? Because I can just use dot the, the, the CDK notation, as I can just give it dot notation to get to the particular resource that I want to override or change. Um, so, yeah. So that's kind of it. I knew when I was kind of putting this together, I was kind of cramming like a lot of information to consume into one place. But um, I'm also um, in the background as time permits writing some blog posts um, around some of this stuff. So um, I've got some cards here if you want to hook up with me on LinkedIn, grab a card and please do so and, um, and I publish the blogs. Um, when you make, if you want to make changes to the code pipeline, how do you do that? Do you go through the console? Or do you no, I do it all in that, go back to that, everything gets changed in that source code. And then I just, that's what the self-mutating thing is. So it's now, so once, um, where are we? Um, so I'm going to go through the entire thing. Yeah, so this diagram here, I'm just going to present right, right. 
So the way that this worked, like, so you saw that, you know, that's Adam that I use, and that's got all my source code, right? So what, uh, as a very first step, what I do is go CDK deploy, um, and, and I've, you know, got my user credentials there, and it's being told which account in that config it needs to deploy to, right? So step one is I deploy it into that tooling account. Once it's there, it ignores my deploy here, and it actually grabs that repo and goes, what do I actually need to deploy here? So every time I commit to that CDK um, pipeline repo, that's going to update the pipeline. So if I added, say, another microservice into that, or you know, I added another Lambda function or something like that, I um, make those changes, I commit to the repo, it gets deployed straight away. So that, so I never have to go into the console again. Like that meets that objective that I was talking about, where as a developer, I just want to deploy from Git. I don't want to be mucking around in console, I don't want to be on the CLI, I just want to write code and deploy it. Yep. Um, as a developer, you are doing the deployment as production, or you have something like a fabric protecting the credentials to avoid you to have access to production? Yeah, so if, so, like, I need, like, for me to deploy any of this stuff, I need to have um, a set of um, credentials in that tooling account. Um, but the, the other set of, the other thing that Control Tower and Landing Zone and that gives the ability to do is put control policies and guardrails around those target accounts. So that's how I can control. Um, so you know, developers can do what they want to their heart's content in the repo, but if the set of permissions or, and controls don't permit it to happen in that target account, it isn't going to happen. So I can use things like um, there's something called um, a service control policy that each of those accounts have. So I can say you're not allowed to deploy to these regions. Um, you're only allowed to deploy lambdas. You're only with these set of you know controls around it. Like you can get really like lock right down what it is that you can deploy into account. Um, and that's and that the uh, you know kind of rewinding this back to why control tower is so good and or landing zone is because you can build that into the account vending machine. So in other words, I can give a definition up in my service catalog that for this particular account, these are the, that you can only deploy these types of resources to these types of regions. And every time somebody vends one of those accounts, the set of controls are already baked into it. So again, this being able to deploy and, and operate at scale and speed are kind of all you know baked into these AWS services. Okay, well that's that's kind of it. Um, Feel free to grab my card if you've got, you know, offline questions, you want to dive in a bit deeper, um, certainly reach out to me. Um, and like I say, I, I know there's a lot to take in here, so some of this I'll be producing blog posts for it, because it's easier to read through it and go, ah, oh, that's how those dots connect to them. But what I hope is, is that you, you know, that it's kind of triggered enough of an idea that you've gone, oh, actually, that's pretty cool. Let's have a look at how we would do it, you know, and check out the CDK pipelines. Thanks, Thank you. Yep. Thank you.